Good morning, intrepid you. Um, this is this wonderful conference uh, was titled Earthquake Early Warning Implementation, and uh, implementation is often called by the science community the last mile. Uh, as an implementer, I'm here to say it's a very long mile, and it's uh, possibly you know an 85 degree incline, and you have to take a large <laughs> busload of people to the top, and if you get there without the people, you got to go back down and get them and come back up. So um, and. User adoption, which is what we're talking about today, is the, the last mile of the last mile. It's the finish line that if we don't cross it, science doesn't get used and possibly doesn't get funded. Um, so th it's, it's important to me, and uh, in my work at Cal OES, I'm the Earthquake Program Officer, and I work with the partners in CISN and on early warning, and I'm also the chair of the California Earthquake Early War Warning uh, system implementation planning project that's going on now. So I am the most interested audience member here, possibly. Um, we have a wonderful panel. The panel isn't up here yet because we need to leave the uh, stage free uh, for their presentations. So what we'll do is they'll, they're going to give short presentations on their, their work and interest area and thoughts on the topic. And then we will uh, bring the chairs up and have a, hopefully a lively discussion. Uh, but, but before we do that, I wanted to uh, just out of interest, how many people in the room are physical scientists? Physical sciences. Uh, how many people are social scientists? Hooray! Oh, hooray! Uh, <laughs> engineers? Wait, wait, how many people are people? Uh, well, I'm get, I'll get to that. Uh, and then, so we've got social scientists, educators, emergency managers, good, uh, beta testers, people who are beta testing Shake Alert right now. John, um, and uh, uh, now everybody else here is a public user of earthquake early warning. So we are all uh, we are all the intended audience ultimately. Um, so I just want to introduce before we uh, before we start who the whole panel is, and then we will uh, have short presentations before we begin our discussion. Uh, we have with us Mark Lucero, and Mark is. Uh, from FEMA, he is the chief engineer of their IPAWS division, and IPAWS stands for Integrated Public Alert and Warning System. Uh, thank you. Uh, pri and prior to FEMA, Mark worked with the Defense Inf Information Systems Agency. He's a certified information security professional and also an engineer, so he's you know nerdy enough to be with us today. Um, Ann Bostrom is here. Uh, Ann is an environmental policy expert from the University of Washington. Dr. Bostrom research interests include risk perception, uh, decision making under uncertainty, and focusing on mental models of hazardous processes, that is how people understand and make decisions about risks. Uh, and currently she's investigating earthquake early warning. We're very glad to have her here. Uh, Beth Pratt-Sitala is a geoscience education specialist, and she works with both UNAVCO and Central Washington University. Her particular focus is teacher preparation, undergraduate learning, and geohazards education. And she is currently the program director for CTEP, which is the Cascadia Earthscope Earthquake and Tsunami Education Program, which conducts professional development workshops uh, for coastal Cascadia uh, educators. And finally, Gordon Wu is here. He is a catastrophe, catastrophe risk analyst at RMS Risk Management Solutions, specializing in the assessment of management of extreme risks. Uh, his special interest is decision making on natural hazards and behavioral and social factors influencing actions. So we will start with Mark Lucero. Uh, Mark. I'm Mark Lucero, Chief Engineer for the IPAWS Division. Uh, what I wanted to do today is uh, give you just a, a quick background on what IPAWS is. Uh, some of you may already know uh, what it is. Some of you may have received uh, amber alerts or flash flood warnings on your cell phone and thought, where'd this come from? Uh, so hopefully I'll address some of that. And then um, really what my goal here, aside from uh, you know 
answering some questions and introducing IPAWS is, is really to, to hopefully answer the question or maybe uh, pose the question of would this system be suitable for an earthquake early warning system for the public? Um, so as we move through here, uh, I'm going to start, start out with a little bit of background why we built the system, uh, talk about some current usage, and then address some of the, actually kind of do some myth busting about what people do think about, you know, how the system works or how it doesn't work. Uh, so this is why we built the system. Um, essentially, um, it was uh, President Clinton who said we need to have an integrated system to alert and warn the public. Um, the IPAWS system really comprised of the emergency alert system for TV and radio. Uh, now we have the uh, wireless emergency alerts, or WIA, uh, for cell phones, and bringing in as many alerting technologies as possible um, for really, really for two purposes. One is uh, to allow the president to communicate to the public um, under the most dire of consequences, uh, the, the bad day scenario, um, if you will, and then also to be leveraged by state and local emergency management, public safety, so that they can tell the public that, you know, something bad's coming your way. Um, so based on that, that guidance, um, the IPAWS division was stood up uh, with the vision of providing a timely alert and warning to the public um, in preservation of life and property. Uh, and, the, and the integrated part of that, uh, really the reason for integrating all these different dissemination types of TV, radio, cell phones, internet-based systems was uh, to catch the public wherever they are. Um, in the old days, when we only had emergency alert system, uh, everybody, you know, typically, and this was back in like the 60s, people spent a lot of time sitting in front of the TV and the radio. Uh, nowadays, not so much. Uh, people are on the go. Uh, a lot of folks have cut the cord for their TV um, and rely solely on their, their wireless device. Um, so recognizing that, we need a way to, to reach the public uh, using the devices that they have on their person. <clears throat> the, really, the way that we did that, uh, the only way that we could do that, was to standardize. Uh, well, we didn't standardize. We adopted a standard uh, for alert and warning. Um, the nice thing about standards is that there are so many to choose from. We chose the common alerting protocol, which is uh, basically it's an XML format with tags to describe the alert uh, and the message that uh, the, the originator wants the public uh, to receive. Um, so here's the, the architecture. I wanna, uh, want you to really note that really the FEMA responsibility, the fe well, the responsibility end to end, of course, but the FEMA controlled portion is just this red can in the middle. Um, the, uh, the, it's, it's basically an aggregation system and a gateway for all the alerts created by state, local, federal, emergency management, public safety, using that common alerting protocol, uh, they can push those alerts to this aggregation system and gateway. And uh, essentially what, what FEMA does is broker the message between the uh, emergency manager uh, or public safety and all the dissemination pathways on the, on the, on the uh, right side. Um, Emergency alert system for TV and radio. I think what everybody really here is interested in is the wireless emergency alerts, um, mainly because of the speed of delivery and the penetration of reaching the public. Um, again, because everybody's got their cell phone on them. I don't think anybody brought a TV with them or, or anything, <laughs> but I think it's safe to say that everyone here has a, a cell phone. Um, so that's the architecture in, in a nutshell at a very high level. Um, how's it being used today? Uh, here are some numbers. Essentially, uh, if you recall the previous slide, you have stuff coming in on the left side from state and local and National Weather Service and so, so on, and stuff going out the right side, which reaches the public. The stuff that comes in on the left side is that top number. 99% uh, of all of those messages come from National Weather Service. Um, and they don't, uh, I guess, ra rise to the level of needing to send an alert to the public. We're talking about uh, weather statements, uh, weather wa um, watches, um, and weather bulletins, things like that. Um, a few of those do ra raise to the level of, hey, tell the public they need to take action. And that's things like tornadoes, flash floods, uh, hur uh, hurricanes, not so much, but uh, uh, tsunami, thank you, um, and uh, dust storm warnings, things like that. 
Um, by and large, most of these wireless emergency alerts have been uh, flash flood warnings, followed closely by tornadoes, and then followed up by amber alerts. Amber alerts are, are going out a lot, as folks in California probably well know. Um, and then the EAS, not used so much to a degree through IPAWS. There are lots of ways to reach EAS today, um, one of them being no other radio, uh, tone alert radios. Um, but strictly going through IPAWS, these are the numbers. And then uh, no other radio itself, not really used very often. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you why over a beer later. Um, so, uh, the two for, for no other radio, those were actually two test messages that were sent by um, uh, a couple of counties. Um, the presidential message, the president has never used the system. The president has never sent an EAS message. Uh, the system's been around in various shapes and forms since the 50s, and it's never been used. That's a good thing, um, if you didn't know. Um, so who can use the system today? Here's a, a, a map showing the statewide emergency management and public safety uh, folks who can use the system. These folks could all send an alert uh, through IPAWS today if they, if they wanted to. Um, again, the biggest uh, offenders on the bottom right corner are Weather Service and the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children for Amber Alerts. Um, I have a county map, but it's a little harder to see and it's not nearly as green. Um, I think over there you might be able to see that there are 305 local emergency management and public safety organizations. Um, those are typically counties. Uh, in, a, in a country of about 3,000 counties, that's just scratching the surface. So we do a lot of outreach to, uh, to state and locals to to say, hey, here's a system that you can use uh, if you so choose. So wireless emergency alerts, um, that's kind of the big so what of IPAWS lately. Uh, here's a quick rundown. I didn't write, build this slide. I don't like it, but it's kind of a little all over the place. But essentially, this is showing what it, what it does. Um, it's a 90-character message that's broadcast. Uh, it's not point to point. It's broadcast, very much like a uh, radio signal. Well, it is a radio signal. but uh, um, essentially, if you're in the footprint of a cell tower and that cell tower sends out that alert, your cell phone will get it, assuming that it is uh, compatible with this wireless emergency alerts. Um, and I've got another slide that talks to how many of those there are out there. The hint is I don't know. <laughs> um, what other things? Uh, it's not really a notification system. Um, as you saw, a million messages coming in and 13,000 going out. It's really more for the, hey, you really need to take action. It's not a, you know, we changed the, the trash pickup day uh, from Monday to Tuesday. Um, so that's what, it's, that's what the capabilities are, essentially. Start with a mandatory tone. Uh, there is a mandatory tone. Uh, you, uh, I'm, I'm not going to try and mimic the sound here. Uh, but it's, it's very similar to the attention tone in e on the EAS system. Um, it is a, it's a, I think it's about six seconds long. It's a, a single pulse followed by two pulses, and that repeats twice. Um, so yeah, it's it's the greatest thing ever, uh, but really, <laughs> it's 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 a it's a it's a tool. It's not the perfect tool. Sometimes you need a hammer. Sometimes you need a screwdriver. Uh, it has its place. Um, there are some limitations. Ninety characters. You can't say a whole lot with ninety characters. Um, it's kind of intended to be like a bell ringer to say, hey, there's something that you need to know about, take immediate action, and then perhaps refer to local media. Uh, not all handsets out there are going to get it. Um, there's, a, a, I guess, a misconception that uh, if an alert went out for this area, everybody in this audi uh, auditorium would get the alert. It's not really the case, and I'll talk to that in a, in a later slide. Uh, some folks don't like the tone. It scares them. They didn't know they had it in their phone. A lot of that has to do with the poor public outreach, People, you know, it, it rolled out and uh, all the, the federal partners and the cell carriers, we all sat around patting each other on the backs that we got this thing done and somebody said, hey, who was supposed to tell the public that this stuff exists? <laughs> um, uh, so there, there was some outreach, it just really didn't penetrate as well as it should have um, and I think we were kind of leaning, you know, it was, it was a lot of this, oh, I thought you were going to do this kind of campaign. Uh, so that is an issue. Uh, this bottom one, I'm going to talk about that later. That's a big deal. Um, 
So here's the real questions. Uh, I put this together after uh, talking to some folks yesterday. So how much does it cost? It's free. Actually, it's not free. It's, it's free to use iPause, but you still need a learning software. You need to you pay for the operations and maintenance. Uh, you need to train your staff how to use the system, how to send alerts. And then there's the public education piece. How long does it take to get there? About 10 seconds. Um, I did some, uh, I, I did some uh, queries in our system and found that it takes about 10 seconds from when you hit send to when it hits the phone. Um, why? Uh, it goes through the public internet. Sometimes there's congestion. Uh, this uh, section 10.510, in part of the regulations, it says that these alerts will not interrupt a call in progress and it will not interrupt an active data session. And anybody who's got a phone that takes that uses apps has probably about 100 apps going and they're constantly calling back to the mothership. That may count as a data session. So when that alert goes out to this auditorium, uh, maybe 30% maybe of the people are going to get it. Um, but then 30% is great. If you compare it to everything else that's out there, subscription-based, uh, I think it's great. Uh, probably the only thing that's better than that would be a siren system, um, because uh, unless you're deaf or hard, or hard of hearing, or you're in a in a house, in a house with a high R value oh, windows, then you won't get it. True. Sure. <laughs> everything has its limitations. It's a tool. Um, uh, also, some folks in this room wouldn't get it because you may have opted out. There's a way that you say, "Hey, I don't want to get these." My phone is an old phone, it's a flip phone. It's not compatible. Um, or maybe your cell carrier or the phone, the, or you're in an area where they don't have coverage. Um, so who's gonna get it? You can't opt out from certain kinds of messages, but the other is either in or out. Uh, you can opt out of the Amber Alerts and you can opt out of the imminent threat, which is weather, civil emergency, tsunami, so on and so forth. You cannot opt out of the presidential message. That's, <laughs> that was my idea. Um, so how many, uh, how many people will take appropriate action? That's the big question. So yeah, it's, it's great, but maybe it's got some limitations. Uh, but I just wanted to show this last slide. This is uh, the first real success story in Amber Alert. Uh, uh, Carlos Orozco was abducted by this woman. Um, and uh, the, the alert here you see went out um, in, within an hour. Uh, the teenager here in the top right, she received that on her phone. She said, hey, Dad, I saw the car. Um, so her dad called 911. Uh, and in here you can see within, within an hour, uh, the child was recovered and returned to her mother, so uh, his mother. So, you know, it's not the greatest system in the world, but uh, it is pretty effective. And I've gone over by two minutes. I'm sorry. No worries. Thanks. All right, so FEMA has the responsibility for alerting the nation, but the system takes 10 seconds to send, has a six second tone at the beginning, and only 30% of the people will receive it. And as I also understand it, it's not necessarily granular enough as, as we need it to be for earthquake early warning. It, is, it does go down to fall down level, so. Census tract? Census tract level, or is that polygon level, or? It's, uh, it goes down to cell tower. Level. Oh, oh, cell tower level. All righty. Well, that's not good news for us, but the the technology is going to improve. And Bostrom. So I don't want to blame John for any of this, but, uh, but just in case you think that any of the data I'm going to show you have too much meaning, I should point out that there is a big confounder, and that's that John has been on the front, John Vidali has been on the front page of the Seattle Times in the last week talking about earthquake early warning. So um, I am here to talk to you a little bit about what we ha are starting to learn about how people think about earthquake early warning in the Pacific Northwest in particular, but also on the West Coast. And the framework that I bring to that comes from some of the work that I've done with others. And uh, this is from a report that Dennis Maletti and Nate Wood, who some of you may know, helped produce with the, at the National Academies. Um, it's a framework that we, uh, that, we, that we used to talk about how alerts are just part, warnings and alerts are just part of a much broader system of education and perception risk interpretation and action that starts with risk assessment, goes through public education, and then involves not only managed alerts, but other natural cues, for example, which in the case of earthquakes, um, 
may not be there soon enough, but, but and then they can uh, com be confounded. So natural cues can also include what your neighbors are doing, for example. So, it's a, it's, so they fit into a, a broader system. And as Jim Goltz with his studies said in the 90s, so short-term warnings require long-term social and organizational preparation to be effective. So uh, Goltz said, and his colleagues did a number of surveys in California and prepared uh, California's activities, so they're probably behind your office's activities case. So, um, so we're thankful to him for that. So I'm going to answer just a few, try to answer just a few questions with some very preliminary data. What do people actually do in response to an earthquake? What might they do in response to an early warning? Have they heard of earthquake early alerts and warnings? Um, who do they think should pay for earthquake early warning? And would they use them? And um, we have data, very preliminary data, from three different efforts. The first is a kickoff meeting that we had earlier this year with the M9 project, which is uh, Cascadia Seas project, we call it, looking at different aspects of subduction zone events and ancillary events, so landslides and tsunamis that might occur in, in as a consequence of a subduction zone events. And we had a kickoff meeting where we had a number of people attending from emergency management, from the state, from from other, some of you might have been there. Actually, I know Richard was there. So a wide variety of stakeholders, but almost all people who have some professional interest in earthquake early warning. And from that, we have 27 of those people who answer the survey. That was about half of the attendees. Then we have some preliminary data from the Building Owners and Management Association of King County, BOMA. BOMA was kind enough to meet with us this week, last week, last week. Um, and they sent this out to their members just a couple days ago. So these data are still coming in. They've sent it to over 2,000 people, and we've gotten 133 responses. So it's a lot of responses for free, but it's not a very high percentage of their membership, and it's hard for us to say yet if it's actually representative of their membership. I'll tell you a little bit about them when I get to those data. And then finally, with Google Consumer Surveys, I've launched a survey in California, Oregon, and Washington, and this is with some extra money they have as a position as part of my position. It's what you call a paywall intercept survey and Google claims and has some data to validate that it is actually representative of the general public. So we are trying to collect uh, just a few hundred responses, so 400 responses from each state, but we've only got a few in uh, so far. So very small amount of data and but it'll give you an idea of what we might see when we get the full data set in. So let me start with the, the kickoff meeting. And we asked people what they would do with earthquake early warnings. And here's what they would do with 10 seconds of earthquake early warning. This is a word cloud that shows by size of the word how strong the association was. You can see that people talk about um, duck cover, hold, uh, they think about what they're going to grab or get. Um, and then some people talk about leaving the building. That's 10 seconds. We also asked about a 50 seconds and five minutes. And here's what they said they would do with five minutes. You can see that there's much bigger emphasis in five minutes on evacuation and doing some other activities. And in fact, we found, these are all still the stakeholders meeting in April, we found that when you ask people what they're going to do, they, as you might expect, say they're going to do more things the longer they think the warning is for. So one of John's concerns, at least, is that if they have five minutes of warning, is that too much? They think they can grab the cat, go get their kid from daycare, and then get under the table. So. <laughs> so, so. So uh, it, it does look like there is a very strong correlation between how long they think they have and how much they think they can do. So that might potentially be a problem. And if I can get this thing to go forward. So this comes um, also from the, the same data. And what it shows you here is we categorize the kinds of things they said. And so you can see the difference between the 10 second and the five minute data. And the big difference is that duck cover and hold drops out of the picture and evacuation is much more likely to be one of the things that they said to do, as well as protecting others and other people. So we created a closed-ended set of quest questions based on those data and based on the work by Goltz et al. and by some other work by Mike Lindell and his colleagues, David Johnston in New Zealand, where they compared responses to earthquakes in Christchurch and in Hitachi, I think it was, someplace in Japan. And they, I'm, I'm sorry, I had the slide in there, I took it out because I don't have enough time. But so these categories are a subset of the activities that most people, um, that would cover what most people would say they would do. And so you can see here in blue is uh, California, in yellow is Oregon, in purple is Washington, and the light blue is BOMA. The, in, in this case, there was a few people who didn't answer the question. So BOMA is the Building Owners and Manage, uh, Managers Association. So 
over 50, well, about 50% said that they would stay what they were, uh, stop what they were doing and stay put. So this is a freeze reaction, and this was the most prominent reaction in the New Zealand and um, Japanese data as well, which is why we put it in here. It's not usually something that people talk about in the literature, at least, and as a response to earthquakes. So they don't, so people don't get under the table and they just stop. Drop, cover, and hold on, not anywhere near the percentages that you'd like to see in terms of um, what, so this is, people were asked if they'd experienced an earthquake, and these are all people who said yes, and then they were asked where and when, so we have data on where and when they experienced their earthquakes, and we haven't analyzed those yet. So it's pretty credible that they have experienced a recent earthquake, and this is, this is a good representation of the people who actually followed the advice that they think they uh, should be following. Protected pits, people or, or property nearby is the next most likely, and then some people actually immediately left the building they were in um, or did something else. In Japan, it's very common, a uh, very large percentage say that they turn off the gas or open flames first, which is something that the JMA was trying to get them not to do, but we didn't see anybody answering that way yet, here yet. In the preliminary data from the t stakeholders meeting in April, there were one or two people who said they did that. So had they heard of earthquake early alerts? So how we asked this is by saying, which of the following news topics have you heard of and gave them this selection of topics? And you can see in California, every, 80 over 80 percent had heard of earthquake aftershocks and over 60 percent had heard of earthquake early warnings. So you haven't quite penetrated the whole audience yet here, but it's getting pretty good. Cascadia subduction zone, which you'd think would be a big deal, at least in this audience, under 10 percent in California. And then you can see that man-made earthquakes and earthquake swarms were a higher, probably random set of responses. If we look at Oregon, it's very similar, though Cascadia subduction zone pops up in people's awareness. And when you look at, at Washington, you can see that it's uh, about the same too, but less earthquake early warnings. Cascadia, Cascadia subduction zone is about there where Oregon is at over 30%. Um, and then when we look at the BOMA group, they're more aware of all of these categories. Okay? So we asked questions that would get at the trade-offs that people might be thinking about between earthquake hazard mitigation and earthquake early warning that many of you seem to be concerned about. And where this seems to hit the, where the rubber hits the road on this is budgeting that, in particular with the stakeholders group, they're very concerned there's a limited budget, and some states are more concerned about it than others, and so they see a trade-off between investing in earthquake early warning and investing in, in uh, building mitigation. So you can see here that over 60 percent, um, well around 50, 60 percent in all the states and BOMA strongly agree that earthquake hazard mitigation, such as reinforcing buildings, reduces the risk of death from earthquakes. So not 100 percent, but it's very high. If we take the same scale and, and ask people if they think they would be better able to protect themselves from earthquake risks, including deaths with an earthquake early alert, the, the percentage agreeing drops to under 50 percent, for uh, strongly agreeing drops to under 50 percent. They're still very positive. Almost all agree, but not anywhere near as strongly as they agree with the building mitigation point. So people do believe that building mitigation is much more important still than earthquake early alerts if you trust these data. Okay, earthquake early warning for the West Coast would cost 17 million a year and could save lives and hundreds of millions of dollars in a big quake. Who should fund it? So we gave them um, these options, local or state government, federal government, private for-profit organizations, private non-profit organizations, and none of the above. And um, they could choose all that apply, right? So that more than one. And here is uh, California, there's Oregon, and there's Washington. So one of the interesting things here is you see that there's a sort of a flip between whether they think more likely to think that local or federal should fund between Washington and Oregon. So, uh, excuse me, Washington and California. So California, Californians are more likely to say local and state government should fund it, whereas, the, whereas Washingtons are more likely to say that, that federal government should fund it. And when we look at BOMA, they're very keen on having both local and federal funded. Now, hardly anybody under 30% thought that private for-profit or private non-profit organizations should fund it, and there, were, there was a percentage of the BOMA people who thought that, not, that nobody should fund this kind of a system. <laughs> and in fact, they don't want to be charged for it either. <laughs> so, so, um, 
So this, I, I have some descriptives here on the side of um, who, we, who they represent. So you can see the dis distribution of the sector of the organization for BOMA, what size their organization is, and uh, whether their organization is local, state, regional, national, or inter international. What you can see here is this is a very diverse sample from this association, um, and 49.6% say they do not think it would be appropriate to be charged a subscription fee for it. Um, they actually said in conversations that they think this should be a service that should be free and available to everyone. How would your organization use an earthquake early warning system if it were available now? These are all people who have responsibility for tall buildings, a lot of them, tall buildings, and a lot of people. So some of them are managing buildings that have thousands of people in them every day. And here's what they said. And what you can see here that they are, um, they're, they're much more likely to say that they would not alert the public. So that's the red, would not do. And they're most likely to say that they would alert emergency manager. That's what they would do. So it goes from light for would do to less, to darker blue for likely to do to very dark blue for might do and red for would not do. Um, so they're not ready to use, not everybody's ready to use automated shutoffs or slowdown of critical systems either. Uh, so there's still some educational outreach to be done to these kinds of groups. And finally, um, just to bring this home to all of you, we asked the BOMA people in general in responding to alerts, including drills at your place of work or study, how compliant are you? Extremely compliant. And how compliant are other people? Not so much. <laughs> so thank you very much. <laughs> Interesting data, particularly combined with uh, what Mark told us about the, the feedback they received from uh, the public being unprepared to hear uh, those initial AMBER and, and uh, WIA alerts. Uh, so uh, Beth Pratt-Sitala. What I'm going to talk about now is um, the reasons for and ways to engage educators in hazard and preparedness communication and messaging. I'm going to um, talk about three different projects that have been funded by NSF EarthScope, two of which have asterisks I've been involved in myself. Um, the Cascadia EarthScope Earthquake and Tsunami Education Program, CTEP, um, is the one that's the most ongoing at the moment. If we think about the overall picture of what we're dealing with here, I think we can agree that we're all aiming for greater resilience. I say Cascadia because that's the orientation of this project um, and resilience for America. Um, so how do we get up to there? If we think of coming at it from the science, here's the science, here's the information. Um, and we want to move up um, to reaching the general public. Uh, educators are right there, the ones talking to the general public that can, and the students that can get the word out. So I'm talking here teachers, park interpreters, and emergency management educators. And we can move up through both the formal learning and the sort of free choice informal, such as parks and museums, to get to there. Um, and so in the Cascadia, the CTEP project, we are working on joint professional development for these different types of educators. There's reasons to include them in things like this. If we look at the research on behavioral change, um, what should we be doing? Educators can help with this a lot. Simple, consistent messaging um, from trusted sources, like educators, um, for a long time, like a generation, um, and seeing others take preparedness steps. Also, FEMA suggests that science classrooms are very underutilized for the connections to um, hazards that could be made there. Um, the Teachers on the Leading Edge project went from 2008 to 10 and wound up in 2011. We were, we were doing Oregon and Washington teachers on topics of geology and hazards. And so just a quick on what we accomplished in that, just as of 2011, and presumably many of those teachers have since reached more students, more than 30,000 students were reached. That's a conservative estimate. Um, and we didn't know what was going to happen was more than 1,500 other adults were reached through programs that teachers took it upon themselves to do for teachers, parents, administrators. Um, I could give you lots of graphs, but I won't, but I can tell you they significantly increased content knowledge, confidence in teaching, days spent on the topic, um, and they implemented a notable proportion of the materials we provided for them. Concurrent to the Teachers on the Leading Edge project was um, when I wasn't personally involved in, 
um, but the EarthScope interpretive workshop. So they were working with park and museum interpreters um, to do similar geohazards and geology topics in the time period prior to when CTEP started. 100,000 viewers of interpretive programs run by former um, workshop participants and more than a million visitors to facilitate facilities that had been served by EarthScope, including with um, kiosks on natural hazards. So the potential reach working with audience um, of educators is really large. So this brings us to CTEP. We brought the PI expertise in both formal and informal learning channels together into CTEP. Again, with the primary aim to improve disaster resilience and the steps we go through for that are they need to learn the geoscience, then they need to understand how that's related to the risk, the preparedness actions to take, and in this case, because we're bringing different types of educators together, the process of collaborating with people who teach to a different audience. We have six workshops. We've done two or two per year. We've done three, so we've done these three right here in the middle. Um, about 25 participants each for four days. Then in the spring, we bring the, the two groups together from that year and do a shareathon and see what people have done. Um, to give you a sense of the type of components that these programs have pretty much all had, um, it, it features learning through a sense of place, place-based education, places people have emotional attachments to, they are more likely to um, be willing and interested to learn in that. We can also pair the love people may have for mountains or beautiful <coughs> coastlines with an understanding that that comes along with hazards. You don't have to fear them, but you do have to account for them. Uh, there's earth science content both in the field and the classroom and ongoing research that helps us know this really is happening and it will happen. Um, we feature best practice pedagogical methods. Our uh, participants um, experiment with the same things that their students will do, building a better wall, doing tsunami investigations, earthquake investigations. If anyone thinks that they would like these materials, they are on our websites. You can talk to me. It is non-proprietary. We want to get it out there. Limit wheel reinvention. Another important feature is having people working in teams. There's a lot of evidence to show that if you collaborate in learning and implementation, um, this is Juan de Fuca. Um, and Sally's subduction right there, then you have better <laughs> implementation, okay? Um, and you need to make this transfer easy. You need to have digital resources and kits of materials, physical materials, books, maps, posters, and we've collaborated on a lot of animation <coughs> development, and I'm going to show you part of an animation that features earthquake early warning. It is only a small part of our emphasis, but it's there, and I want you to see what it is so far. It's too long for me to show you the whole thing now, but to let you know it sets up why a GPS seismic combined network would be appropriate in Cascadia, starts out with why Japan did underestimate the magnitude. Uh, um, and now we'll just jump to the Cascadia section of it, which is hard to see on this tiny little screen here. Okay. Can we develop one in Cascadia? Though? With a coordinated effort by seismologists and geologists, a better earthquake and tsunami early warning system is possible. To understand the components of early earthquake warnings, let's watch an animation of a hypothetical magnitude 9 Cascadia subduction zone earthquake. The epicenter is offshore of Port Orkney. It is narrowed to the awful warning path from Portland and Seattle. The earthquake generates seismic waves as it ruptures in the waves. Ten seconds after the key waves hit the coast, the seismic network locates the hypocenter and determines the magnitude as sudden or larger. It cannot say how much larger. As I spoke the lab, the Port Orkney GPS station lurches seaward, indicating significant ground displacement. Knowing they might have little time after shaking stops to reach high ground, residents evacuate immediately. 20 seconds after initiation, <coughs> rupture moves past Cape Blanco. S waves produce strong ground movement, and the Cape Blanco GPS station lurches 10 meters, indicating that the Port Orkney station wasn't a fluke data point, but that this earthquake is greater than magnitude 8.5. Tsunami warnings are issued for coastal communities and broadcast throughout the Pacific Ocean. Coastal towns farther north, like Cape Bay, Oregon, have about 20 seconds warning, which allows people to drop cover and hold on, get away from dangerous machines or chemicals, and shut down gas and electric supply lines. Region-wide emergency signals are issued indicating when strong ground shaking will arrive. Portland is warned that damaging S waves will arrive in 80 seconds. 
Seattle has a two minute and 20 second warning. One minute after the earthquake rupture began, key waves arrive in Portland. As the rupture and S waves reach New York, we will see that GPS station alert southwest, indicating the earthquake will approach the Mount Cooper Mountain. Strong shaking affects the inland valleys east of the ongoing rupture as it generates more seismic waves. Two minutes after initiation, Seattle feels the initial key wave jolt. The S waves generated by the rupture offshore west of Portland begin producing the most violent ground shaking in Portland. Shaking lasting up to five minutes will damage older, unreinforced buildings. This animation shows that Portland and Seattle could have several minutes warning before the strongest shaking hits. With a minute of warning, additional precautions include stopping rail and road traffic, closing bridges and tunnels, halting airport takeoffs and landings, opening elevator doors at the nearest floor, stopping surgeries, and getting emergency personnel and equipment ready to respond. At three minutes, escorts arrive in Seattle as the rupture passes north of Astoria, where GPS stations move southwest by five meters, confirming a magnitude of nine. Rupture has progressed north to offshore Vancouver Island, with violent ground shaking continuing in Seattle for several more minutes. We know that a rupture like this one depicted here, along the entire length of the Cascadia subduction zone, last occurred on January 26, 1700. A similar scenario could occur with an epicenter initiating anywhere along the subduction zone boundary. In addition to a joint seismic and GPS network, an early warning system requires public education, as well as an integrated plan with civil protection authorities and telecommunications groups to make such a system effective for saving lives. So you can find this if you just Google for YouTube um, and UNAVCO. This was done in collaboration with UNAVCO. Um, and I'm happy to give you the full resolution version if you just ask me during the break. And um, we're also looking for feedback on this. We are not typical to do animations right in the middle of the science still emerging. So we realized there might be a, um, some refinements that could be done. I also want to give a shout out to one I didn't, I wasn't involved in, but just went public um, last week, which is one that um, Diego Melgar, who is um, here, was a co-author and, and, um, and uh, narrator for. And this goes through how the Mexican one came to be and how it works for the alert system down there. And of course, it is also in Spanish as well. So you can Google Iris EPO and YouTube if you're interested in this. It hasn't even been announced yet, just went up. Um, just a quick wrap up on what CTEP has accomplished so far. Again, I could show you lots of graphs, content knowledge, teaching confidence, preparedness actions, optimism for community level action, efficacy that our participants have um, uh, gained in. They're in positive uh, uh, opinion about the mixed educator collaboration. They're implementing our materials, but what we find the most satisfaction in is where they take it. Um, steps farther, such as Tsunami Day at a local museum, um, middle schoolers doing assemblies for their parents and fellow students on preparedness, and uh, tsunami research that sixth graders were doing that won a $20,000 Samsung Award. Um, recommendations to take away from this, work with educators. They're getting the word out. If you're going to do it well, if you're going to do it high quality, you need to have a leadership team that has broad expertise. Um, all the way from earth science through emergency management, social science, and people within the trenches teaching and interpretive experience should be place-based to where they are. Um, it should be easy to transfer with digital resources and kits. There should be teams of participants who collaborate and support each other past the main event. Um, and I personally think that this will need to be embedded, the EEW, with um, a broad spectrum of other hazard content. In order to um, maximize um, the uh, usage of uh, amongst the public of earthquake early warning, uh, I believe that it's really essential um, to put um, earthquake uh, early warning in the context of um, earthquake hazards over all uh, time scales. Uh, as uh, Anne has pointed out uh, in her talk, uh, uh, people's knowledge of earthquakes covers a whole range of different phenomena 
uh, aftershocks, swarms, and so on. So people have to um, put earthquake early warning uh, within the context of their prior knowledge of earthquakes, which can be yeah. all kinds of, of things. Um, I'm very interested in uh, participatory decision making, which is um, the active involvement of people in making these decisions. You have to get them to participate. And one way of trying to encourage a uh, fuller participation in decision making is um, um, to be able uh, to um, explain to them uh, in a coherent sort of, uh, way um, the overall um, subject that you're talking about, which is earthquakes. So if you just consider earthquake early warning, it's clear that it is essential for everyone to have a good basic knowledge of long-term earthquake hazard because it's the long-term hazard which governs the building codes, um, which is the basis of uh, the seismic safety of their homes uh, and their places of work. Um, and also, uh, on an intermediate time scale, um, there are certain uh, occasions when there is an elevated uh, seismic hazard, um, such as during a period of aftershocks and swarms, which Anne was talking about. And um, during these periods, there is an opportunity to engage the public uh, to get their attention um, uh, about earthquakes so that they can take measures, low-cost measures, which can help them prepare better for an earthquake early warning. So we heard from our Japanese uh, friends and colleagues that um, um, after the Tokyo earthquake, uh, there were a series of uh, earthquake early warnings uh, which came during a period of elevated seismic risk. Um, so what we, we need is, is um, a kind of educational process whereby um, during a time period where there is an elevated um, earthquake has, for example, here in California, um, um, even after the South Napa earthquake, it's a time when this educational process can start so that uh, people can be better prepared for a potential earthquake early warning. Um, a point was made, made that uh, people don't even recognize the basic ringtones for an earthquake early warning. And if you haven't had, if you haven't used one and you haven't had a message like this for a long time, then people just forget and, and don't even know what it's for. Whereas um, if uh, say um, after a, a main shock, during a period of aftershocks, um, um, there is uh, 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 some um, operational earthquake forecasting uh, uh, alerts given, then one of the basic um, uh, tasks which can be undertaken then is to remind yourself of what the ringtone is for an earthquake early warning, because during um, an aftershock period, um, there could well be an earthquake early warning. And if, you're, if you've had some kind of preparation for this, um, uh, through uh, uh, an operational earthquake uh, forecast new alert, then this is preparatory to, to benefiting from um, uh, an earthquake early warning. Um, one of the areas I've been working on in the area of operational earthquake forecasting is coming, out, coming up with low cost, or in some cases almost zero cost, measures that people can take um, to uh, uh, help mitigate um, the risk of a possible uh, 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 imminent earthquake. There are many measures which can be taken. And in some ways, um, um, these measures uh, have a parallel with uh, simple measures that can be taken uh, um, in the public use of an earthquake early warning. There are things that you can do which can just make yourself a little bit safer. Uh, crucially, these actions should involve stakeholder participation. So there's plenty of time uh, well in advance of any alert to engage the public so that uh, they can participate themselves in deciding what kind of measures, low-cost measures, um, they may wish um, to uh, follow up on. It's well known amongst um, um, psychologists and those who, who work in the behavioral aspects of risk that actually feeling something, having a sensory cue, uh, such as um, uh, feeling uh, some tremors, low-level tremors, say perhaps during a swarm, um, that's a good time to engage the public um, in, in terms of uh, uh, um, preparing for um, a potentially larger shock uh, to come. So this is an opportunity to get some more messaging out, more education um, about um, earthquake early warning. Um, we've heard a lot about education, but um, an operational earthquake forecast is a good time to provide extra school and adult education, um, possibly um, the organisation of, of additional uh, earthquake drills um, over and beyond um, those which are 
organize on a more routine basis. And something very simple, which everyone can do, which is uh, to carry out some basic seismic safety checks at home, um, at work, and in transit. Uh, but my, uh, my mother-in-law, who lives in uh, San Rafael, he's um, uh, about 79 years old, um, just got out her uh, seismic safety kit after the South Napa earthquake. It was a great time to say, well, where is my, my seismic safety kit? Well, well better after the, better doing late than never. So, 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 so at least she got it out now. She knows where it is. Okay, so, so this is a good time to, to do the things that you should be doing anyway. And I think this is a, a key message that everyone knows that, that um, people never do uh, what they're meant to be doing in, in terms of, of safety for anything. But um, during a period uh, of an operational earthquake forecast, um, as a minimum, this is a great time for people to do what they should have done before. In, in terms of, of uh, um, giving a, a, an example of, of, of the value of education, I think it's hard to find a better uh, a case um, then of this English schoolgirl uh, Tilly Smith, uh, who, to my mind, is really the, the poster girl uh, for um, uh, uh, seismic uh, safety education. Uh, she is English. Um, we hardly have any tsunamis in, in England. In fact, I mean, the only tsunami was one from the Lisbon earthquake in 1755. So, um, <laughs> the very fact that there's that there's no English word for tsunami just is, 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 in itself reflects the fact we don't have them. Okay, in fact, the the, the, the word which used to be used. Uh, was tidal wave, and that reflects the fact that in England we have lots of storm surges which give rise to tidal waves. So basically, you see, so we never had a word for this, so we had to use a Japanese loan word of tsunami. Now, how can it be that a 10-year-old schoolgirl from a country which doesn't have tsunamis can save the lives of 100 people in a tsunami? Which is about 100 more than most seismologists saved in the, 2000 and <laughs> in, in, in the 2004 Indian Ocean tsunami. Through education, through education, because uh, in, her, in her school, she had a geography lesson which showed a video of a Hawaiian tsunami. Right? We, okay, we don't have tsunamis like that in England, but she, she saw a video of it. And she saw um, a video showing the water receding and frothing. And uh, um, she and her family were vacationing in Phuket in Thailand. And uh, she saw uh, in uh, live action what she had seen in this video and shouted, tsunami. Uh, her mother thought she was just having another bad day at the beach. <laughs> um, but um, but she, she shouted tsunami. She could have been wrong. The whole point is this, that, that um, as with all tsunami warnings, um, there's a certain false alarm rate. Okay? So there was a possibility that she could have been mistaken. Okay? But um, she had the courage to shout tsunami, and um, she saved um, uh, 100 lives on the beach. Now, um, a point I would like to make is that um, um, a large number of people here in California have come from other parts of the country or from abroad where the seismic hazard is low. These people um, know next to nothing about earthquakes, um, but in terms of um, safety, in my view, um, visitors and tourists are as important as anybody else. Now, one of the, the, the issues there is that uh, um, when you have um, a significant part of the population who are uh, living and working in the Bay Area, um, what can be done to try to raise their level of earthquake awareness? Um, and also, from a practical point of view, with regard to earthquake early warning, um, if someone has come from abroad and arrives in San Francisco, um, they won't be in a position to receive these, these messages on their cell phone. <laughs> Okay, so this is, and these people are, are, are important people. Um, so this is a, a question which, which I, so I flag up. And, and um, again, I raised, raised this, <coughs> this case study of, of Tilly Smith, which, <coughs> which is that even if you're from um, um, an aseismic country or place, um, it's possible um, to be clued in to earthquake risk. You don't have to be from a seismic country <coughs> to be able to... to, to, to to be aware of the risk, so, so that, that's why there's hope in this, this basic message. <clears throat> um, in terms of um, public uses of um, earthquake, uh, I don't want to use my last uh, slide here, is that opportunities need to be taken to provide all Californians 
with more education and uh, in, in information. Um, just in terms of low-cost actions that could be taken, even if you're um, in a, a well-constructed uh, building, you can have a, a, a very well-constructed um, uh, hospital, for example. Um, there are um, extra safety measures that could be taken just to prevent um, I injury or worse. <coughs> so I just listed a few here. This is, uh, hang these are the kind of, of messages you, you might get, which are similar in a way to, to uh, what happens uh, on airplanes, where during a period of turbulence, uh, you're told to sit down and fasten your safe safety belt. We have the same kind of situation here, which is in a hospital which is built to the latest seismic safety <laughs> standards. It, it would be a good idea for the infirm to be able to sit down uh, rather than uh, to risk uh, falling over uh, during an earthquake. And same goes for holding onto handrails, uh, etc. So there's a lot that can be done to encourage public use of earthquake early warning. But uh, fundamentally, this is my main point, which is um, there should be um, a holistic uh, uh, programme of education of the public um, to embrace all the information about earthquakes which they, they, they know about. And I think this will end up being uh, more successful. Okay, thank you.